Father, we just come to you this morning, and we're so thankful. Lord, we're just so thankful for your love. We're thankful that you're the God of all comfort, and no matter what, no matter what happens in our life, we can turn to you, and you comfort us. Lord, we don't expect life to be easy. As a matter of fact, oftentimes it's hard to do the things that you ask us to do. But you comfort us and you humble us and you help us to do those things. And then you bless us when we do those things. Lord, I lift up today. I pray for all of us that we leave here better than we came in. I pray for those that are grieving. I pray for those who have illness in their family or or, uh, are still recovering from leftover parts of of COVID and uh, hard to breathe and things like that. Lord, I pray for healing in their life. I pray that instead of worrying that they trust and comfort in you and go forward and go forward. I thank you for that. I pray today as we look at your, as your word today, we will all be better for it. I thank you for that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. All right. So we always start off, there's three questions for you to be thinking about as you're going through this. This is what our life groups do. When our life groups come together, they, they use these three questions. Three questions, just to think, to prepare your mind and heart for what you're going to hear from this boring old guy up here. What point in this message is most impactful for you? Just be thinking about that ahead of time. And when you're writing your note, go, ooh, star, I like that. And you may star all of them, and that's okay. How does it challenge you, change you, or affirm your way of thinking? And third, how will you put into practice what you learned today? Because that's the key always. I hope you leave here knowing that, uh, well, that's a good thing, but how do I apply that to my life? And, and, and pray about it and practice that. Because what happens, the way the Holy Spirit works is I can be sitting there talking to you and all of a sudden something that I'm not even talking to you about will come straight to your mind that God's asking you to do. Now, I I don't think the lottery or something like that, that might not be from God, but the person at work that you need to minister to or what you need to do to help make your life better or whatever, that, that, that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. So, first of all, today we're talking about, is the Bible reliable? And like I said, there's, there's a, there are people that no matter how much you present, uh, as far as that goes, they're, they're, no, I'm just not, I'm just not going to believe. I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. But, but that's okay. As God works on them, it's your job to represent Jesus well, right? Right? It's your job to do that. So, so, uh, you know, we don't make fun of people that aren't Christians. People can make fun of us. They can. Boy, think about what Jesus went through. So you can be made fun of and not get mad. You really can. You, can. you can fight anger with kindness, with love. It really changes people. It'll either change them or make them feel so weird that they might even get more angry. I'm just going to give you that heads up. You're supposed to be angry right now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what happens. When I talk to older Christians or when I, when I talk to Christians who are actually even at the end of their lives, the one thing I hear over and over and over again is I regret that I didn't live for God earlier. I regret that I I didn't do the things that God in his word taught me to do earlier. Now, I want to tell you something. I I was, for those that don't know, I was a counselor before I became a pastor. And, uh, And when I started my counseling practice, uh, I was brand new and I was out there. I had to make a living. I had a wife, two kids and a mortgage. So I had to make a living. So I'm out there with no, no income. And so I'm out knocking on doors. And, and, I, and I, went to, I went to the Waxahachie County Courthouse to get referrals from jail. Now, I go there and, and the guy is, I have my, my freshly made blue, I would never ever do light blue cards again. But back then, I had light blue cards that said Royal Ferris, counselor. And then up in the corner, teeny, teeny, beady. There was a fish. And the reason for that is, the reason it was tiny was I went into that thinking, these guys aren't going to talk to me if I'm a Christian. You know, I'm talking about, so, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my spiel and, and the guy goes, well, Mr. Ferris, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to use you. There's, we have a lot of counselors in our area. There were like two that I knew of, and there's a lot of people in the Waxahachie, Red Oak, uh, Ellis County area. 
So in my shame, now I haven't mentioned being a Christian. I get up and I'm walking out. Well, thank you so much. I'll leave you my card. He goes, thanks. I'll, I'll put my your card in your file. And I could see him file 13. It was when, but, he, he, but all of a sudden I hear, heard God. I'm not sure if he uses words like this, but maybe it was Latin and I interpreted it different. Stupid? Tell him you're a Christian. Now, it may be Upid's Day. That's Latin, right? And that, oh, pig Latin, pig Latin. It may have been Upid's Day. Upid's Day, tell him you're a Christian. So I'm almost at the door and I went, hey, did I tell you I'm a Christian? You're not going to believe what he did. You're a Christian. We need Christian counselors. <laughs> it's like, you know, and, and it was like God hit me right between the eyes. And he said, look, I called you to do this and you're going to do Christian counseling. You're going to teach people what the word of God says about how to live your life. Now, now I know that the interesting thing is I would get a lot of people referred to me who were really weren't even Christians and I could still teach them Christian principles without giving them the verse, chapter and verse. You know what I'm saying? And guess what? It started changing their lives. Their marriages started getting saved. They, they, they started coming out of depression. They started learning how to, they may not have got rid of their anxiety, but they learned how to trust God and deal with their anxiety. And those kind of things happened as they, as they went through and started doing the things that God teaches them and tells us to do. Over and over and over again throughout my career as a teaching psychology and everything else, here's what I found out. When people study people, they find out that God is right. They really do. And the things that you know that God, you know that God wants you to do different. I just have one thing to say. Suck it up and do it. He never says it's going to be easy. Do you think it was easy when Jesus gave his life for us? Dude, that was so brutal. It was so bad. Least we can do is suck it up and be kind to people and, and be loving and, and be the kind of person that, 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 that people... People look at you and, and they go, wow, you know, um, here's what I know about the word of God. It does change us. It does change us. I like to use the word budology. You know, you've got theology, but I got budology. And what budology means, it's not B-U-T-T -T, for those of you that are giggling. What budology <laughs> means, what at one time I was doing, the first time I ever taught and used that word, a guy came up to me afterwards and said, my daughter leaned over and said, we're not allowed to say but. This is a different but. Budology means what? This, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but. now I see. I once was so nervous, but now I have peace. I once was so angry, but now I have joy. Life changes what's going to change people. The things I'm going to tell you today about the uh, legitimacy of the written word won't change somebody. But when they see the written word changing you, that's what changes them. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So... So that's where we're going with this. Many people who are not believers, they just believe that the Bible is unreliable because it was just written by a bunch of men. And then sadly, there are many believers, including pastors. When I was doing that, starting my practice, I, I went to this church, met with a pastor who had just graduated from a seminary. And after I presented myself, he said, uh, well, Roy, you seem like a nice guy and I think you're a good counselor, but... I'm not going to refer anybody to you. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, you're a Baptist. Well, I, I went to a Baptist church and I went to a Baptist college, but I'm a Christian, aren't you? He said, well, but I don't believe everything in the Bible is true. And you do. Yeah, I do. And I left there so angry that night that this man thought he was God enough to decide which, I don't know about you, I'm not God enough to tell you that this isn't from God because I'm not God. I, I don't have that, that kind of power. Now, now today, uh, I want to give you a couple of references, okay? Because I can't tell you, I mean, I've got to keep the message to three hours, so I can't tell you a whole lot of it. But here's one reference, ready? Write this down. Just write down, God breathed, the whole title is The Undeniable Power and Reliability of, of Scripture by Josh McDowell. 
And if you type in God breathed on Amazon, Josh McDowell, and it'll come right up. It's 11 bucks paperback. Good stuff. Good stuff. And then I am a fan of gotquestions.org, which is a Christian uh, ask questions. Sometimes late at night when I'm trying to think of something to tell y'all when I get here, I'll go, I'm going to cheat and go to gotquestions.org and, and look. And, and go there and type in, is the Bible reliable? And they'll give you more, and then they'll give you other places and other references to look at. So did y'all write those down? Those are good. I promise you, it'll be good. Now, this theologian said that there exists no document from the ancient world witnessed by so excellent a set of textual and historical testimonies and offering so superb array of historical data on which an intelligent decision may be made. And if you're like me and I'm going, what did he just say? The Bible's for real. That's what he just said. You can just write that down and quote me. Royal, the theologian, not said the Bible is real. This is what the apostle Paul wrote. All scripture is inspired by God. What that means is, is these people who wrote the word of God, the Holy Spirit breathed into them what to say. And I know right now, if you're thinking, I don't know, Royal, there's some things about the Old Testament. There's things, just hang with me and, and then you've got more resources to go with that. And it's useful, ready? This is so for real. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Duh. You know, that's why I'm saying sometimes when you're being a, a, a godly, loving, caring, not judgmental, judgment never works. You know that, right? That, that, it just doesn't. It just, it just makes somebody mad. But when you're being that person, one or two things are going to happen. Either they're going to want what you got, or they're going to get ticked because you embarrassed them. So don't let the judgment be an embarrassment. Just let your life be an embarrassment. We all look at people and we go, oh, I want to be like that person. Be that person. And you don't have to make a lot of money to do that. You, you can have any job and do that. You can be living in any neighborhood or culture and be that. Just be that person. Be like Jesus person. That, that, that's, just, that's just the way that it works. So teaches us what's wrong in our lives. Next it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. It teaches us to do what is right. Now, here's the interesting thing, because as, as, as we go along, um, oh, sorry, go one more verse. God uses it to prepare and equip. Circle that. Prepare and equip. Christianity is not about getting baptized and just going to church. God wants to prepare and equip you because you've got a job here. You know, we give money to missions, but you're a missionary wherever you're at. No matter what neighborhood you live in, no matter where you go to work, you're a missionary when you get there. Prepare and equip his people to do every good work, to do the work of Jesus. So what if the church, who Jesus is our cornerstone, what if the church, what if all of us, because I want to tell you the numbers are pretty bad. My whole life I've heard this. Churches, 20% of the people give, 20% of the people serve, and the other people do nothing. Now, I want to tell you a little secret. That is not Life Connection Church. Every once in a while, I'll have a pastor or a friend of mine come visit, and they'll go, wow, you got people serving all over the place. That ain't me. That's a spirit in y'all that does that. You're God's love with skin. That's what we practice. If you're new here today, you need to know that we believe that we are God's love with skin. That's our job. People are supposed to be impressed with Jesus by the way we go about doing our life. But what if the church did that? What if, what if, what if 100%? What if it was even 80-20? That would still be sad. But instead of 20 doing it and 80, just think about that. All, think about how the world would be changed. Because remember, we used a verse a couple of weeks ago where where uh, Paul writes that God's not being slow about coming. He's waiting. He wants the change to happen, and then, and then he's going to come. He's going to come. So here's what we have to understand. First of all, the, this is a pretty amazing stuff. There's no other book, just like we read the theologian said a little while, there's no other book that can match up to anything as far as the, the legitimacy of a book that was written 2,000 years ago. It's not a book. 
It's 66 books. It's 66 books. It's written by 40 plus authors over a 1500 year period and it all fits together like a puzzle. Now, think of any 40 authors you want and put them in a room and see if they can make that happen. And as you study the Word of God, now you got to realize, a lot of people go, oh, the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the Old Covenant. The New Covenant. The, what the Old Testament teaches us is that without God, we can't do it. We can't do the rules. The New Testament is the covenant. It's, it's a new covenant. It's the relationship. And if you don't understand that, uh, that's a whole different message. You can go to God. Go to gotquestions.org and ask what the new covenant is. It's written in three different languages on three different continents. And the, con and the consistency of the message without contradiction. I know people say that there's contradiction, but, but just hang with me. It's history. It's poetry. It's prophecy. The Old Testament has 17 books of history and 17 books of prophecy. And then for the New Testament, who do you think God would have used? There's all these disciples that are following Jesus and they're willing. You know, all the disciples were moder mo moder martyrs. Y'all help me out here. Martyrs. You know what that means? They died for their faith. Some of them died hanging upside down on a cross. They were beaten to death. They were every, every bad thing you can ever possibly imagine. And then John, everybody says, well, John didn't die. John died of old age. After they beat the crud out of him and then sent him out to an island to live the rest of the days of his life. And guess what happened when he was under all that duress? He wrote Revelation. That's powerful, right? That's pretty darn powerful. Think about, I don't wish this, maybe I do. Think about what you could do under duress. Because guess what you're doing under duress? Who are you hanging on to the most? God. And if you're a man of faith or a woman of faith, you're not whining. You're thanking him for this opportunity to get you ready to do what he wants to do with you. You go, what? God would do that to you? Well, look, if you want to build muscle, what do you do? I have tried eating everything, and it doesn't work. Eating everything does not build muscle. It's just not. You've got to do things that are, guess what, painful. And I don't care how much they advertise it. It just, you got to do it. You got to do it. So that's how it is with our faith. And the more we use our faith, the more God. So, oh, oh, oh I got off track. So who did God use to write most of the New Testament? He didn't, use, he didn't use one of the ones that was Jesus' first people. Who did he use? The Apostle Paul. And if you don't know who that is, the Apostle Paul, Jesus had already died and resurrected and was gone. And the Apostle Paul was out killing Christians. That was his job. He was a Jewish uh, leader and they wanted to nip in the bud the new faith. And he's going down the road. It's called the road to Damascus. He was going to Damascus one day and, and Jesus blinded him and knocked him off his horse. And then he was blind for a long period of time as God prepared him to do ministry. And then the man who only met Jesus in the spirit and heard him talk in the spirit became the man that started the, the Christian church discipling people and writing, wrote most of the letters of, of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he wrote 13 letters on how to live the faith out and why. And again, a man under duress, a man under duress who God used. Jesus put him under duress after all the awful things that he did, but he gave up his life and he started spreading the gospel. And guess how the Apostle Paul died? They beat him and hung him upside down on a cross. Now, if I was hung on a cross, I'd want to be straight up, wouldn't you? <laughs> but it was, you know, but, but that's a sacrifice. All these guys died for their faith. Are you willing to die for your faith? It's possible one day. I don't know of our time. If you lived in, uh, there are Christians in Afghanistan right now. There is a target on them. And they're staying there to tell other people about Jesus. You think God's going to use them like crazy under that kind of duress? They're going, no, don't take us out. We're here. 
We're here. They're here for a reason. They, they want to they lead people to a relationship with Jesus. Ephesians 2.20 it says, together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And what he's talking about here is the word of God. He's, he's claiming the authority of the word of God. He says, we're, we're building this foundation on the apostles and the prophets. They're the ones that are writing. They're the ones that are serving. They're the ones that prophesied. Y'all know we talked about this uh, a week or so ago, uh, that there were 300 prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus that Jesus made come true. That Jesus made come true in this next part of the verse. And the cornerstone is who? Christ himself. The cornerstone is Christ himself. So let's just look. It was written by the prophets and the apostles. The apostles are... uh, There are a lot of people nowadays that call themselves apostles and there are a lot of theologians that say that they're really not apostles because the apostles God used to start the church, to write the Bible, to do that. And and I'm not going to say somebody's not an apostle because they know and I don't. But from what I read and understand about what apostles are, the apostles are the ones that started the Christian church. Uh, and then the prophets, the prophets are the one that, that prophesied ahead of time and, 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 and Jesus fulfilled those. Um, prof, prophets would hear from God. Uh, the interesting thing, the early, if you were a Jew before Jesus, who are God's people, and they're still God's people, by the way, and God's got some amazing things. That's why uh, supporting Israel is so important and, and recognizing that they're God's children, even those who are not uh, professed to be believers in Christ. God's still got plans for them. He's, he's, they're still his people. But the, um, they didn't, we have the Holy Spirit. See, one of the reasons why we can do the things that we do and, and, and understand scripture better and live for God better is because we have the Holy Spirit in our life. And if you're new here and you, you don't know about that, uh, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we have to be careful with that because I've, people often say, ask Jesus into your heart, or they say, accept Jesus as your Savior. But, but really, what Jesus said was, you ready? Follow me. Matter of fact, the original guys that followed him he said, leave everything behind. Don't bring no clothes. Don't bring no money. He said, I don't even have a pillow to lay my head on. So, so that, that, that's the original. But, but Jesus says, he says, follow me. He says, follow me. Now, that's why we have the Holy Spirit in our life. So let's just look at a few things about the writings of the, the prophets and the apostles. First of all, there's a lot of continuity you know how often I want to say continuity? Every time, I kept practicing that. Now I'm going to do it wrong every time. Continuity, continuity. 15 plus 100 years, uh, three different languages, three continents, consistency of message without contradiction. And I'm going to show you some things that, they've, that, that over the years they've found through archaeological digs and things like that. Um, it's written by poets Peasants, philosophers, and kings in moods ranging from agony of defeat to the passion and the thrill of victory. And every, here's here's the deal. This is why, to me, as someone who counselors my background, uh, I can teach the word of God and its principles to anybody and it can change their life. But if they're believers or they accept or start to follow Christ while I'm teaching them, then they also have the power of spirit, the power of the spirit to help them do that, to help them do that. So every current issue, everything we deal with, well, well, they don't talk about this. They don't talk about this. It doesn't matter. When you know the word of God, you just know. Matter of fact, sometimes people will, 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 I'll baptize people and they'll get up and they're They've made this commitment to follow Christ and, and they'll come to me. They don't know anything. They haven't read the Bible yet. They and they'll come to me and go, you know, this is something that I do. I don't think I should be doing this anymore. How do you think they figured that out? They haven't read the Bible or anything. How'd they figure that out? Holy Spirit. Because see, there are things that are lawful that go against God's word. 
So we don't just do things because they're lawful. We do things because it's what God wants or God doesn't want us to do. So, um, the one thing, it's a story written from the beginning to the end about mankind. It's, it's about Jesus dealing with mankind. And, and again, it's a whole message on why and, and all. But anyway, the next thing is continuity, continuity. Did I say that right? The next thing is circulation, circulation. No, I already knew how to say that one. Circulation. <laughs> Number one seller Bible of all times. It's always the number one selling Bible. From the time they did the printing press, it was always the number one selling book. Every year since 1455 when the printing press was invented. Now there's something about that, right? Translated to over, it's translated to over 90% of the world. It's translated, and, and they're still, from what I understand, from what I read, they're still working on now because of, I mean, just think about this. If God's plan is for Jesus to come back after everybody in every language all over the world gets a chance to read and understand and know the Word of God, the more we get computerized, the, you know, they used to, when, when they had to translate to some language, they just, now it's just computerized, right? I think that's what it is. I'm just guessing that. I didn't read that, but I assume that's what's happening. But, but, but it's still, uh, it's translated. The Bible translations have always been translated from the original languages of Hebrew, 99% of the Old Testament, Aramaic, and the Greek in the New Testament. Of all the ancient writings, listen to this, if you want to compare it to other things that people accept, Homer's, the Iliad, ranks next to the New Testament in possessing the greatest amount of manuscript testimony. It was written in 900 BC, the, the, and the earliest copy was 400 BC. There's 643 copies of the original. Now watch this. I need my glasses so I can not screw it up. For the New Testament, there are currently more than 5,000 manuscripts with most early copies anywhere from two to 300 years later. Now, a, a document is reliable the closer it gets to the time that it was written. The 5,000 uh, 5, manuscripts, most early copies anywhere from two to 300 years later. Remember, uh, Homer's 400 BC is the, er is the earliest one that they've got. And some less than 100 years later. This gives a better than 99% confidence just in the context of the original text. Did you know that? I mean, when somebody, now remember, people will use this as an argument for you. And when you give them information back, which you can find in, in the, those two references that I gave you, they, they still are going to dismiss unless the Holy Spirit is really working on them. And, and they're wanting, but, but you know, people can, <laughs> I've, I've talked to people before and they've come into a worship service and, and I'll talk to them later and they were just mad and they didn't feel right and it didn't go right and, and they'll complain that the air conditioning wasn't cold enough and the, and the music was, you know, the, the, somebody needs to teach that guy how to play guitar, all that other kind of stuff. And then there'll be people that'll just come out going, that was the greatest thing I ever heard. Where'd that come from? The Spirit. I don't know about y'all, but on that last song, Alicia, I was crying over there. And I'm going, Lord, please don't let me make a fool out of myself right now. You know, I'm just going, Lord, please don't. And I'm, you know, and that's the Spirit. I don't really cry like that, but I'm not going to show you how because it's a whole lot worse. But uh, it's ugly. It's ugly crying. It's ugly crying. In the entire New Testament, only 400 words are questioned. In the entire, let me say it again. In the entire New Testament, only 400 words are in question. And the variance of these words is so slight that no doctrine of Christianity is affected by the slight potential alterations in the meaning. Again, people will say, uh, when I worked at Tex Power and Light over here in Euless, there was a, it wasn't a 7-Eleven, but it was a convenience store right next to it. And there were two Muslim guys that, that 
I don't know if they owned it. I think they owned it. But I would go in there all the time and get a Coke or whatever. And, and, and I told them that I was a Christian and I would talk to them. And the thing they said to me over and over again about why they didn't want to believe what I believed was that because of all the translations, it, it's been changed so much. But it hasn't. You know, a true Muslim won't read a Muslim uh, Quran unless it is in uh, Arabic. If it's translated, a lot of will say, nope, can't look at it, can't look at it. But it's not that way. It's not that way with the word of God. They've, they've been so careful with that. Accurately survived over 3,500 years. No other book has suffered the kinds of attacks the Bible has from ancient Rome to communism to Islam proves itself with accurate prophecies. Listen to this. There are over 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. 2,000, more than 2,000 have already happened. 40 authors from all over the place over a 1,500-year period. They write all this and the prophecies and everything in there and already two, over 2,000 of the 2,500 prophecies have come true. Look what uh, Deuteronomy says. It proves itself with accurate... Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Take to heart... Did I skip something? Oh, I did. No, now we're there. We're there. Go, next. I didn't... That's why I screwed you up. That was my bad. Okay, next. Okay, take to heart all the words of warning. This is, this is the Old Testament. Take to heart all the words of warning I have given you today. Pass them on as a command to your children so they will obey every word of these instructions. Can I just tell you something? If you're a parent or a grandparent, the way you live out your faith is so important to your kids and your grandkids. The talks that you have when you sit down with them, the, the, when you do things, do the right things in front of them. You know, go screw up somewhere else. But in front of your kids, do the right thing. Do the right thing because of the effect that you have on them. Don't let them decide whether you go to church or not. I've seen that over and over and over again. You know, um, my generation, the generation before me, most churched in America. Then my generation little bit less, the next generation less, less, and now there are lowest percentage of people ever in the history of America are Christians right now. So we've got our work cut out for it. The, the people, you used to be able to walk into your office and everybody in there was a Christian. It's just not like that anymore. It's just not. So it's, it's imperative, it's important that we live our lives out the way we're, we're supposed to live our lives. He says in verse 47, he says, these instructions are not empty words. It's not rules. Circle this. They are your life. They are your life. And if you can get past the, I want to do things my own way. By the way, if you want to do, if I want to, and I've done a lot of things my own way, right, Lisa? I've done a lot of things my own way. And that's me deciding to be God over God. And it, it screws you up. It messes you up. And, 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 and the more you, the, I just wish, I wish, like I said, people say in their latter days, I just wish I had started following God seriously earlier. And I started at 25 years old. I just wish. Who knows? You know, I may be able to pronounce words like continuity. Because <laughs> I'm not very educated. So... By obeying them, you will enjoy, circle it, a long life in the land you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. And this is, he's talking to the, uh, to the Jewish people. But, but you get the same thing in the New Testament about it being life. Also, there's scientific evidence. I'm not giving you much in that category, but again, you can look that up. Scientific evidence. Did you know, did you know that Isaiah wrote that the world was round? Four, seven, 680, 700 to 681 B.C. And ever since then, people that didn't believe Isaiah until, is Columbus the one that decided it was round? See, I told you I'm not very smart. But every, Magellan, but everybody else thought you just fall off the end of the planet up to that point. 
I mean, that's, that's science. Oh, you go, you don't believe me? Here's the verse. Bing. God sits above the circle of the earth. What does that look like? What does that look like? The circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes a tent from them. Also, the Bible talks about blood healing uh, and, and that, that healing comes within the blood. I don't know about you, but every time I go get a physical, I have to give a what? They try to figure out how healthy I am, right? There's, there's nobody in here. If you, if you go for a physical and they're not taking your blood test, they're, they, you can only get so much going, ah. But your health is in your blood. Your health is in your blood. Uh, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. And the biblical accounts, okay, I'm going to read to you some cool stuff. The archaeology, okay, glasses, back on. Be ready to go ah, or ooh, ooh, ah. Okay, y'all do ooh, y'all do ah, <laughs> y'all dance, whatever y'all do. Okay, archaeology find, found in the 1920s confirmed the presence of cities which, much like Ur described in Genesis 11, which some skeptics doubted had existed so early. Clay tablets dating to 2300 BC have been found in Syria, strongly supporting Old Testament stories, vocabulary, and geography. Skeptics doubted the existence of the Hittites until the Hittite city, complete with records, was found in Turkey. <laughs> Do Marines say that? Isn't that a. Oh, yeah, y'all go ooh ah. Ooh ah, ooh ah. Okay. Even the miraculous occurrences of Genesis. Listen to this. Ancient Babylonian records describe a confusion of language in accordance with the biblical account of the Tower of Babel. These same... <laughs> ooh, uh, ooh, uh. Okay, I'm not a very good cheerleader. These same records describe a worldwide flood an event present in literally hundreds of forms in cultures all over the world. Does that sound familiar? Come on. Gosh, this is so cool. Let's just do this the rest of the day. I told you just three hours. All I got is three hours worth of stuff. Um, the sites where Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, once sat, have been found displaying evidence of fiery and violent destruction. Even the plagues of Egypt, I know y'all thought those were not real. Oh, it's just the Bible. God's trying to make a point by making up a story. Even the plagues of Egypt and the resulting exodus have archaeological support. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Okay, we'll do it one more time and then I'll move on. <laughs> I'm so proud of y'all. Human experience with God's word and his spirit. That's the, that's the part that uh, I can vouch for that. I can tell you this. When I'm away from God, I feel anxious. I feel depressed. Things make me mad. But when I'm close to God, it doesn't mean everything gets good. But I handle it better. So I can pretty much tell. I, 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 can, I can wake up in the morning and think, ah, oh, just, I'm just not feeling it. And I can look back and go, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done this. I should have spent more time with God. I should have done this. And, you know, and, and I do this for a living. But I'll just tell you, when I'm doing it for a living... It doesn't make that big a difference in my life. But when I'm doing it to worship God, look, I hope you never do your devotional because, oh my gosh, I got to do my devotional. You know? Because you will not get, and then you'll go, why am I not? You know, I, I use the Bible app. How many of y'all use the Bible app? I'm on a 50-day streak. 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, when you open up the Bible app, it tells you your streak. And the bad thing is, you can kind of forget it one day, and when you open it the next day, it goes one, and you go, oh, oh. But when you look at that word, even if you don't spend much time with it, soak it in and talk to God and tell him you're grateful. You know, you know what God wants from us more than loving God and loving people? Which if you're new here today, Jesus said there's just two rules. Y'all say it with me. Love God, love people. He wants us to be grateful for the good and the bad. Anybody ever told you that before? Be thankful you just wrecked your car. What? No, be thankful. However you want to make that thankful, you be grateful. And, and that, that's life changing. And when you sit down and you look at, even if you've got two minutes to spend with God, do it with gratitude. And then I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. If you will practice God's presence all day long, you can feel close to him without even reading your Bible. Now, I'm not saying don't read your Bible. What I'm saying is you can practice the presence of God and you know what ends up happening? You will want to read your Bible more. But you got to practice being there with him. you got to practice him being there with you. Because by the way, he is. If you ever feel like God has bailed on you, he hadn't. You have. You have. And it's just because you're stinking stubborn. That's all there is to it. And, and there are things that we let overcome us and, and overwhelm us and, and we just got to practice God's uh, presence. All right, I'm going to finish with two verses two awesome verses. I'll just go ahead and cut it short. We're not going to go till three o'clock. We're just going to stop right here. So look at these last two verses. For the word of God is alive and powerful. Can anybody say amen on that? I mean, you know, if you don't feel that, you can get that. And one of the reasons you may not feel that is you've never really committed to living for Christ. There's a difference. In, we, there's a lot of things we believe in. I believe in George Washington. Don't you? And if you don't, you're stupid. <laughs> if you don't, we wouldn't be here right now. We'd be, I'd be speaking to you in German. You know, we almost had to speak German. And thankfully, they decided on English. But you know, if, if, if the, more you, the more you practice his presence and you talk to him all day long and, and you listen, but you have to have Jesus. You have to have Jesus. It can't just be something you believe, as we talked about in the Apostles' Creed. It's something you have to believe into. Into. It has to be who you are. Watch this. Watch this. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit. That's that, that conviction you feel. That's the Holy Spirit, the Word of God going. It, he makes it obvious to you. That's why, that's why we can feel so crummy when we go against it because we've had that, we've had that, to it, that, that word come in and between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. That's that private time. That's when you're listening to the word of God taught. That's when you're singing a song. I think, I think, mate, what if, what if, Gene? What if when we read the Bible in the morning, we sang it? You wouldn't want to be at my house, but, but just what if? Because I don't know about you. There are people that think worshiping music, singing is not important. And, you know, so they'll show up at church after the worship's over because they want to hear the word. But when we pray for our team before the service in the morning, we pray that God uses our worship to soften our hearts, no matter where we're at. I, I, I want to give you, next week, before you come, even if you've had the worst week ever, I want you to come, and before you get out of your car, first of all, get here early. You are finding out it's getting harder to find a seat now. So, so you get here early, you sit in your car and go, okay, God, I'm going in to worship you. Listening to the Word and everything else will work out because your heart will be softened and you'll and you'll know. And then watch this verse. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Now, I talk to people all the time that are just ticked to God 
because we, he thought, we thought this was going to happen and I prayed this and I felt like God told me that and his word says this. And, and, and let, me, let me show you. See this, see this verse? Your word is a lamp to guide my feet. You know what this says? God doesn't tell you what's going to happen way up ahead. The way you follow God is one step at a time. People come to me and they say, they say, I, I've told you this before, but something happened this last week. They had a wreck or they had a heart attack or they thought they had a heart attack. And, and they said, God's got something big planned for me. I know he does. What do you think that is? And, and, and I'm pretty blunt sometimes because I love you. And I don't want you going, oh, God said something big planned for me and it didn't happen. My answer to that is, are you doing the little things he's already asking you to do right now? Because he ain't going to give you big if you can't do little. You know what I'm saying? I think I'm done. I think I'm done. Ooh, ah. Ooh, ah. All right, you pray with me. Father, we come to you this morning and we are so thankful for today. We're thankful for your word. Lord, I pray that we live it. I pray that we live it. I pray we, we memorize it, we read it, but most importantly, that we have an attitude that comes from it, a love attitude that comes from your spirit through your word as you teach us. And I pray that for us. Lord, I pray that all of us will live for you, that we'll live for you in our marriage, we'll live for you in our job, we'll live for you parenting, we'll live for you in the way we handle our money. I just thank you for that. And Lord, I, I pray that as, as we give of our tithes and offerings, and then we give to other places missions, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that we bless you. And I'm thankful for your blessings. And Lord, if there's anybody in here today who doesn't know you and wants to give their life to you, I pray that today be the day they not wait another second Lord, I just pray that they, that they thank you for Jesus and want to live for you for the rest of their life. Even the person who's been going through the motions of Christianity their whole life, maybe today's the day that they really get serious about following you, whether they're watching online or watching here in person. We thank you for that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 